Hi students, uh, this is going to be a long one. So because period seven to me has just so much information, um, the way I usually teach it is I usually break up period seven into two mini units rather than one larger unit. Um, so just to kind of keep it very, very similar, I'm also going to break up period seven, at least for these videos, into uh, two smaller ones just so then it's not like an hour long or something really really crazy uh, like that um, So when we're talking about period seven, uh, we're specifically talking about the years of 1890 to 1945 So we're talking about progressives all the way through to the dropping of the atomic bomb of Hiroshima so yeah, it doesn't seem like yet. Yeah, it's all that long, but there's two world wars, there's a Great Depression, there's the Roaring Twenties, there's imperialism, there's just so much information uh, to kind of go over with this that, like I said, it, it just it's just way too much and it's going to bog everything down. So um, this is just going to be part one of period seven. Now, don't get me wrong, if you know your teachers kind of make period seven into one big thing, by all means, go for it and just kind of watch them back to back. Um, like I said, I'm just splitting them up into uh, two separate sections just for, you know, that reason. So where period seven really begins is going to be right after what we talked about this Gilded Age where we're having a lot of industrialization, um, the industrialization that was going on, the um, other aspects of strikes um, the Gilded Age, uh, things like that. So these progressives, and look at the root word, progress, they're trying to reform a lot of the things that are going wrong in the cities. Uh, one of your first progressive individuals um, is going to be a man named Lincoln Steffens. And Lincoln Steffens is writing about the corruption that is happening in St. Louis, very similar to how Thomas Nass was doing the political cartoons about um, Boss Tweed, uh, in which he's exposing all the corruption that Boss Tweed was doing. And Lincoln Steffens and a bunch of these other guys are going to call themselves muckrakers. And what a muckraker is, if you think about muck, muck is a swampy, dirty stuff. And if you're raking something, you're cleaning it up. So in this case, they're cleaning up all of the corruption um, all of the filth that these politicians were doing over the course of, you know, their time in these cities. And one of these main muckraking magazines is McClure's Magazine. That was one of their, you know, main, um, you know, main magazines. And Lincoln Steffens writes a book called Shame of the Cities, in which he goes over how all of these political machines we're not really doing um, the people living in the cities any justice whatsoever. Uh, and a lot of these, you know, muckrakers are going to try to do other types of reforms as well. Um, for example, um, Ida Tarbell. Ida Tarbell pretty much exposes Rockefeller um, and the whole entire oil industry in which he's saying, look at all of the corrupt things that he is doing. Um, another one is Upton Sinclair, who writes a book called The Jungle about all of the horrible working conditions and inhumane things that are happening in these in the slaughterhouse, and, like even to a point where people are falling into meat grinders and then people are like eating the meat, which is going to eventually cause reforms um, as we kind of go on from there. And the thing is, these muckrakers believed not in social Darwinism, which was the survival of the fittest, but reform Darwinism, saying that, you know what, reforms can help these people uh, survive and that there needs to be some sort of intervention uh, that needs to happen in order for these reforms to actually begin. So, the these progressives were more middle class to upper class, very college educated individuals that were, you know, trying to do uh, their thing. Um, and there's other reasons why, you know, some of these reforms are trying to happen. In 1911, you have the Triangular Shirtwaist Factory fire. 
in which these, um, um, I believe it was a uh, hundred and forty six women were burnt to death because their the exits were locked and there was no fire escapes and everything like that. So this was just showing once again different working conditions that weren't exactly going well. You had political machines that were taking advantage of the immigrants and this were Jane Adams, who I know I have discussed in period six with the whole house was trying to help immigration. You had Ray Stenard Baker, uh, who was trying to really promote the idea that lynching wasn't exactly a good thing and, you know, some African-American rights. So you have a bunch of different muckrakers that are really kind of, you know, going, um, trying to push the agenda forward um, at this time. So these progressives were trying to attack the sins and the vice of people that were living uh, in these cities. So don't get me wrong, there are going to be some good things that come out of this, okay? You have some Supreme Court cases like Mueller versus Oregon, okay? And Mueller versus Oregon was talking about limiting the hours of work for women um, because they, they, were, they were talking about the limited uh, working um, physical abilities of women. So Mueller versus Oregon did that. Where the another one that's eventually going to be passed is the Keating Owen Child Labor Act, in which the United States was saying, "Look, you can't ship goods made from child labor um, into other states." Eventually, the Supreme Court, though, is going to find this to be um, unconstitutional and illegal. So. Um, one of your main progressive uh, presidents um, with all this is going to be Theodore Roosevelt. And if you remember, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president when William McKinley, uh, who was president at the time, gets assassinated in 1901. And then Theodore Roosevelt, you know, assumes the presidency as the vice president of the United States. And he was a different type of Republican where William McKinley was very big business. Theodore Roosevelt is what we kind of call now a progressive style president. And he says that the United States should have a square deal. And by a square deal, he's just pretty much saying that everything should kind of be equal. And the way that I usually draw it, I draw a big square up on you know my whiteboard, and I pretty much say, look, he's saying that consumers should be protected and businesses should be regulated and government should have the regulations to regulate the businesses and protect the consumers. And then this last part is going to be the environment where Theodore Roosevelt, very interesting individual that he was a hunter, but at the same time, he's also an environmentalist. So Theodore Roosevelt really is trying to promote the ideas of progressivism um, as he's going on. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt is known as a trust buster. Uh, he would go in and break up a lot of these monopolies. Now, don't get me wrong about Theodore Roosevelt. He was only trying to break up the bad trusts, and he said that the bad trusts were the ones that interfered with commerce. So not every single trust um, is going to be a bad one. Um, one of the first things of when Theodore Roosevelt is president that kind of showed what type of president he was going to be is that he interferes with the 1902 1902, wow, 1902 coal miners strike um, in which then he gets both groups to sit down and says, you guys are figuring this out right now because the United States is running on coal. So you guys better go get your, your acts together. Um, other things he does is that he passes the Meat Inspection Act and the Food and Drug Admin or Food and Drug Act, which kind of makes the Food and Drug Administration, in which these are going to pre be protecting consumers of what they are ingesting and putting it into their bodies. Um, he also passes the Elkins Act, which strengthens up the ICC, which is the Interstate Commerce Commission. He passes um, Hepburn Act in 1906 which gave the ICC more powers so Theodore Roosevelt was definitely a progressive style of president and by 1908 he's going to come to regret this he says that look I don't want to run for a third term I've done my two terms and he picks a successor it's going to be William Howard Taft now Taft uh, runs for election he beats William Jennings Bryan go figure William Jennings Bryan's going to lose again but Taft is nowhere near 
what um, a progressive style of what Theodore Roosevelt was. Now, don't get me wrong, he will do some things, but he is just not the same type of politician. Uh, he really does not do too much, even though he does bring a lot of, you know, antitrust cases to the Supreme Court. And really what his big downfall is going to be, other than, you know, he doesn't listen to Theodore Roosevelt and, you know, he's not exactly a very good uh, speaker. Um, he's never been elected to any position whatsoever until he's elected president of the United States. He's a lawyer. He would rather be a judge. In fact, he will become Supreme Court Chief Justice down the line. It's this ballinger Pinchot affair in which he picks the wrong side. And he picks the side of, of development rather than environmental conservation. And when he does that, he angers a lot of progressives and he angers Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt's going to put his hat into the ring again for the 1912 election. Taft is going to win the nomination. But Theodore Roosevelt kind of breaks apart this Republican Party because Roosevelt starts up this third party called the Bull Moose Party, in which then he goes head to head with a um, lesser known governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, in which Woodrow Wilson easily wins uh, the electoral vote. But if you're looking at the popular vote, Wilson only gets 41%. Taft gets 23 and Roosevelt gets 27. So if you add all of Taft and Ro Teddy Roosevelt's um, vote totals of the popular vote, you would actually see that it's going to equal about 50%. So Wilson should have actually really lost this if you know Taft was just running by himself or if Theodore Roosevelt was running by himself. But it doesn't exactly happen that way. And Woodrow Wilson becomes the second Democrat to become president since Andrew Johnson. Since 1868, and we're talking about 1912, and he's the second one. The other one's Grover Cleveland, in case you're probably wondering, wait, what is the other second you know, Democratic president? Now, the thing to know about Woodrow Wilson, and, and this kind of goes with all of the progressives, one of the major things that they don't really put on their you know, agenda is segregation. And Woodrow Wilson is a outspoken racist, okay? Specifically in 1916, there's going to be a movie called Birth of a Nation, which is about the KKK. And Woodrow Wilson is actually um, quoted in the movie. It was a silent movie, and there's a quote in there. He was pretty much saying how amazing the KKK was uh, for this Southern, you know, revival of Southern pride. Oh, the South will kind of rise again. Okay, so Wilson, just like other progressive presidents, they are not going to really be worried about segregation at all or a lot of African-American rights. Instead, where Woodrow Wilson's going to be focusing a lot of his time on is something called the Federal Reserve Act, in which he is trying to get the economy um, regulated uh, through the United States government, in which this creates you know, the Federal Reserve Bank, in which we kind of still have today. And Wilson goes off of this idea of waving the bloody shirt, kind of bringing back these ideas of the Civil War um, overall um, into kind of politics and whatnot. So Wilson um, also passes in 1914 the Clayton Antitrust Act in which this is protecting labor unions. Uh, while he's present, you're going to see the temperance movement is going to be on the rise with the 18th Amendment, which is going to ban the sale, consumption, um, production of alcohol and alcoholic beverages, okay? And um, other things he's going to be doing is women's rights uh, issues, especially with the 19th Amendment, which grants women the right to vote. So there are going to be, like I said, negative things about Woodrow Wilson, um, and there are going to be some positives as well because he was trying to help out at least some of these um, issues, at least with economics um, and talking about big businesses. But like I said, he does not really worry too much about segregation. In fact, during this time, you're going to have W.E.B. Uh, du Bois. That's going to create the NAACP talking about the activism. Um, you know, you need to be an activist in order to get things done. Um, another one of these civil rights uh, individuals that's going to rise during the 19-teens and 1920s is going to be Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey kind of has this movement in which he says, you know what, everyone should go back to Africa if you can afford it or be a business owner. So he said, be a business owner or let's go back to Africa, specifically Liberia. So those are just two of the, um, you know, 
ideas coming from there. Now there are environmental. Um, we had already talked about with Theodore Roosevelt, in which you're going to get you know national parks uh, to be created, and John Muir is going to have you know his national parks, and the Forest Service Act of 1905 that's going to kind of be the precursor of creating these national parks um, that are going to be made. Now there's also different reforms for local governments. Okay, the 17th Amendment um, was passed, which was the direct election of senators. Before this, the governors would pick the senators or the people to represent the state um, as a senator. So it was almost like you, whoever you voted for as governor, that's kind of who you're looking at to become senators. Now there's a few other different things that was going to be, um, at least with local politics. You have a recall in which you can now recall an individual that is an elected um, position to remove them from office. There's a referendum and an initiative which are kind of similar. They're both dealing with legislative uh, issues in which you can, um, the people are going to vote for these issues on the upcoming ballots and that citizens could introduce legislation. Um, there was also direct primaries, so no longer voting for president of the United States is going to go uh, straight into the Democratic or Republican uh, conventions. It's now going to be a primary that is going to be um, created in order to have the people more say into uh, politics. And lastly, secret ballot voting, this Australian ballot, this one man, one vote, something that really hadn't been done before, um, especially since in party politics, this political machine politics, which it was vote early, vote often, now people could actually have protection knowing that their votes were going to count and their votes would be secret. So this is going to now lead into the next part of our period seven, since we already had the progressives, and it's imperialism. Okay, and imperialism is the idea of going out um, into foreign lands to take over, not colonize, but imperialize in order to try to make, you know, their country better. But there's other reasons why people were doing this. And a lot of this has to deal with this idea of white man's burden. When we're talking about white man's burden is that some Americans felt like they needed to go into other countries and civilize the people that were already living there. Okay, it's definitely a, has some racial overtones uh, when it comes to it. Um, there's definitely going to be a conversion when it's talking about religion, okay, that people were trying to Christianize some of these individuals that were, were not Christian before. But there's also military reasons why. Uh, Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan um, pretty much had said that the United States needed to imperialize or go off into at least the Pacific Ocean um, in order to use them as refueling stations. Um, and the main reason why Mahan is kind of starting to freak out a little bit is because Europe has already been carving out Africa by this point of the 1800s and they were going into Asia. So there really wasn't that much land left uh, for you know the United States of America so the pressure was on for them to do some of these things now they've already had opened up trade to Japan but um, other places that they're going to start going into is Hawaii and they started this Hawaiian trade you know with sugar and there's a queen there and I'm going to butcher her name because I for whatever reason I cannot say her name Lily Kawana. Um, hopefully I'm pretty close to it, but there's going to be an argument between the Queen and um, a man named Sanford Dole who does pineapples, let's put it this way, and plantations, in which then Dole um, pleads with the United States to help them take over Hawaii to annex it and eventually make it a territory of the United States, and the United States listens, and then they pretty much remove all of the Hawaiians from the area and kind of take over their land. And then the United States uses Hawaii as a military fueling station and for trade. Um, another place is going to be China. Okay. And when we're talking about China, we're talking about two separate things. Number one is going to be the open door policy in which everyone was saying, yes, China's an open door for trade. Come on in. Now, China, and this is something I talk about in AP European history, is that 
China doesn't exactly want anyone in there. The British forced themselves in there with something called the Opium Wars, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a drug war. Okay, so Westerners were getting involved with China, even though the Chinese want nothing to do with this. So there's going to be a rebellion. Specifically, they're called boxers or the Harmonist Fists. Exactly what it sounds like. And this group was attacking um, Westerners, Europeans, Americans, and specifically Christian missionaries. They will lose. Um, they will lose this rebellion, but it is happening. Okay, and then. Um, you know, there are going to be people that are going to be against imperialism altogether, saying that it was wrong. Mark Twain is one of these individuals. Um, you know, William Jennings Bryan was also an anti-imperialist, and they create something called the Anti-Imperialist League. And it goes from things being like, we shouldn't be invading other people's areas, to racial overtones saying, no, we don't want, you know, people of a different group or ethnicity to take jobs away from Americans. So you had anti-imperialists on both sides, both saying no to imperialism, but there's different reasons why. Um, some of the more racial people is uh, Benjamin Tillman. Uh, he's also known as Pitchfork Tillman in this case. He um, is one of the individuals that's kind of going with these racial overtones on some of the reasons why it shouldn't be happening. Um, and then we start getting to some of these insular cases, and they're island-related cases, and they're mostly talking about granting constitutional rights uh, to people living on these islands and how they're saying just because the United States takes over some of these islands, there's no reason why uh, they should be given these rights to kind of begin with. Um, specifically, this is going to lead into the Spanish-American War, okay, which is going to be in, 19, in 1898. And where this is really coming from is that uh, there's something called yellow journalism. And these yellow journalists are newspapers, and they're trying to get more headlines so people will be buying them. So they start talking about um, the atrocities that are happening in Cuba from a guy named Weiler. And this, they call him the butcher. And um, Americans like, wow, we need to do something about this. We need to protect these Cubans. Um, and William McKinley, who's president during this time period of the Spanish-American War, you know, he's kind of like, I don't know what to do. It kind of sounds good, but we kind of just can't go and attack, you know, Cuba, which is by this point being owned by Spain. But... It makes it easy when the USS Maine explodes. And these yellow journalists, and I kind of call it like fake news because that's kind of what they are, they're like fake news headlines, they're trying to bring about this idea of jingoism. And jingoism just means extreme patriotism. This idea of jingoism. And they're saying, look, the Spanish attacked our ship. The USS Maine sunk. You know, what are we going to do about this? And what really actually happened is that the USS Maine had engine failure. There had nothing to do, uh, you know, with the Spanish attacking them. So they call this a splendid little war because it goes from June 22nd, 1898 to July 17th, 1898. It's real fast. The United States wins. Um, most of this fighting is going to be in Cuba. One of the bigger uh, battles is going to be San Juan Hill, in which Theodore Roosevelt was a commanding officer of the Rough Riders, uh, is going to be involved with it. And then you also have uh, Dewey with the Philippines. Um, Commander Dewey, uh, Dewey with the Philippines, I'm taking over Manila. Um, so that's really like the Spanish-American War. It's going to be the aftermath that's going to be more of the thing. This Treaty of Paris in which the United States gets the Philippines, uh, gets Puerto Rico, and gets Guam for exchange of $20 million. And they will, they're granting Cuba independence all at the same time. But in the Philippines, there's going to be a rebellion, a revolution. Um, Amelia Aguinaldo, who is the Filipino... Um, nationalist independent person and we're fighting um you know filipinos in this case in which we do put down the filipinos and we do have atrocities there and the united states is going to be in the philippines um pretty much all the way up into world war ii until the japanese take over the philippines and take us you know take it pretty much over um so let's get into now the imperialism, or at least the presidential policies with imperialism 
after the Spanish-American War. Uh, your first one is Theodore Roosevelt, and Theodore Roosevelt's policy is known as the Big Stick Policy. And the quote that he says is, speak softly but carry a big stick. Talking about that, you know what? You can come and attack us and we're going to fight you right back. And this policy was um, added on to the Monroe Doctrine. It's known as the Roosevelt Corollary, this idea of that the United States will fight in Latin America if European countries are going to get involved. And what a corollary means is just an addition to an already existing, in this case, foreign policy. Um, and the main country that Theodore Roosevelt gets himself involved with is going to be the creation of Panama, in which um, there, it, this area of Panama was through the Colombian government, but the United States fights Colombia and pretty much institutes a brand new government of Panama, in which case Theodore Roosevelt gets the rights to build the Panama Canal, in which the United States will own up and through 1999. And we'll get into why all of a sudden 1999 when we get into period eight, towards at least the end of period eight. And Theodore Roosevelt, even though he was like a war hawk before, he does get the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, um, he, the reason why he gets the Nobel Peace Prize is because of his uh, diplomacy through this thing called the Russo-Japanese War, where Russia actually loses to Japan, and it's going to be a whole thing kind of leading into uh, World War One. And speaking of Japan, uh, there was... In this case, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Japanese immigrants are coming into the United States and they're being faced with uh, racism. So you, Theodore Roosevelt kind of comes up with this gentleman's agreement with um, Japan in which Japan agreed that they would limit the amount of Japanese immigrants that were coming in, in which case Theodore Roosevelt would take away some of the segregational laws that were happening specifically in California. So that's going to come up into when we talk about the other Roosevelt FDR in World War II, this idea of the gentleman's agreement and uh, racial overtones with the Japanese, specifically out west. Um, Taft does, William Howard Taft does dollar diplomacy. And his idea was that if we pay off the debts of these Latin American countries that owe money to Europe, Europe will want nothing to do uh, with these countries, but now we will have control since we control the debts the country um in countries i should actually say that he gets himself involved with is uh, dominican republic mexico but the main one's gonna be nicaragua okay those are the main ones that taft uh, kind of you know, gets involved with and then the last one's going to be moral diplomacy which is woodrow wilson's um, and his idea about moral diplomacy was that the United States wanted to have the same values with some of these governments and put in some pro-American governments, or at least put in governments that would be more favorable to listening to the United States, um, in which case there was a government in Mexico in which the United States, it was Huerta, and the United States was able to remove it, put it in a pro-American government, only to have another rebellion come in from an anti-American group led by a guy named Pancho Villa, who was able to kind of you know, win and I shouldn't say win, but not get caught by Woodrow Wilson um, and the United States. So you can see how um, this is kind of all going here. And Wilson's Secretary of State was William Jennings Bryan, who's an anti-imperialist. So Wilson wasn't exactly all about imperialism, but he was just about putting in pro-American government so then trade could uh, form. Um, Wilson was also kind of an isolationist, and we're going to see as we kind of go into World War One. And World War One, we're not going to go into, like we said, the battles or anything like that. It's going to be more of the things that are happening domestically here in the United States. But why World War One starts, at least through European countries, is nationalism, secret alliances, militarism, and imperialism. It's those four things together. So strong militaries, secret alliances, people are just going out there and colonizing. Um, and this idea that nationalism, how we want to promote our country is better than everybody else's. And while this is happening, this starts in 1914, um, the United States is remaining neutral. And they try to remain neutral the entire time, except there are th things that are coming up with this. Uh, the Lusitania is sunk in which Americans um, were on the ship or sunk and killed. Okay, 
the Germans declared at one point something called the Sussex Pledge in which they said that they would give warning if they were going to sink any, you know, ships and whatnot that were like passenger ships, not like warships. So they violate this and they start sinking American uh, ships as well that were trading. Now we have to keep in mind is that the Americans were actually trading like Zippo to those central powers that the powers that were Austria, Hungary and Germany and Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire and the United States was trading with the allied powers which was France and England okay so they kind of already made their bed uh, with all of that so it makes it kind of easy for the Germans to keep on attacking them but what was the nail in the coffin was this thing called the Zimmerman note and what the Zimmerman note was it was a telegram that was being sent to Mexico in which Germany said look Go and attack the United States, keep them, you know, from coming into this European war, and you can keep whatever you want. That all those lands that you lost in the Mexican session, um, in this Mexican American war, all of those lands can be yours again. Thing is, the telegram never gets to Mexico because the British intercept it, and it's just like social media. They're like, hey, look, look what I just screenshotted. I'm going to go and show you. Look what he was saying about you. And that kind of puts the United States into uh, this war. So when the United States enters the war, uh, there's definitely going to be pro, uh, you know, war propaganda. You're going to see your Uncle Sam posters, the We Want You. There's um, anti-American uh, in this case. You're going to have your German immigrants that are going to be, you know, for the central powers, you know, because of Germany. You're going to have the Irish immigrants that are anti-British. Uh, so they're also going to be pro uh, central power. So there is... You know, this idea of anti-Americanism uh, that's also happening, which leads into something called the Espionage and Sedition Act. And what was happening was that the United States pretty much said, hey, look, you can't talk about the United States. If you cause, you know, a hindrance to this war effort, it's going to be treason. So there's going to be people who are arrested for it. In this case, it's going to go up to the Supreme Court in which it was Shank versus the United States. And the uh, Supreme Court said that this law was constitutional as long as it posed a clear and present danger uh, to Americans in this case. So please keep this in mind for a connection to another time period because you can even talk about how John Adams did the whole Sedition Act as well, talking about, you know, the free speech aspect of this. You can go as far back as saying John Peter Zanger with censorship. So this is kind of occurring and they're very, very similar. Now within the United States, in order to try to win this war, there's going to be the War Industries Board. There's going to be the Food Administration Act. Herbert Hoover is in charge of the Food Administration Act. And that's like the rationing uh, that was happening. And all this is going to help the United States to win the war. Woo! Go USA! Woo! Um, now, after the war, you're going to start to see the Red Scare is happening. And this Red Scare is that in 1919, um, the Soviet Union becomes a brand new country now at this case because of this Bolshevik revolution, this communist revolution, and people were scared that this was happening. This is going to lead into a lot of strikes that are going to occur during uh, 1919. And because the United States is so scared, they start raiding these things called Palmer raids in which they start going in and taking um, people who they felt were known communist or known Bolshevik or known people that were going to create um, communism within the United States. Now, going back into a foreign thing of it, Woodrow Wilson with this Treaty of Versailles, he goes there with 14 points in which he's going to try to end a war forever. Uh, the European powers all laughed at them, and they pretty much only do one, which is the League of Nations. So the problem with the United States is that then they start having a League of Nations ratification debate back in the United States in which the Republican senators led by Henry Cabot Lodge were saying, absolutely not, we do not want to be involved with this because then we're going to be involved in European wars. And Woodrow Wilson's like, but if we're not in this as being one of the main people, there's going to be another European war. What can I say? Woodrow Wilson's eventually going to be, you know, right because of everything that does happen. But keep in mind that this Treaty of Versailles that punishes Germany is just going to lead into the rise of Hitler. And the United States not being involved in the League of Nations or being involved in European issues whatsoever 
also will lead into the rise of Hitler, in which the foreign policy of the 1920s and 1930s is going to be this idea of uh, isolationism. Okay, there's the Washington Conference of 1921 in which the United States uh, reduces uh, their navy. They start having high tariffs and trying to keep away European goods so people just bought American and not buying European, that European markets would kind of, you know, falter. And then the Kellogg-Brien Pact, which actually stated that war was illegal. So you can see that the United States towards the very end of you know World War One and towards the 1920s and 1930s, they want absolutely nothing to do with Europe. This idea of isolationism, which is going to be causing intolerance within our own country, but we'll save that for part two. So thank you for listening in on period seven, part one, which was progressives all the way through World War One. Um, please subscribe so then you can keep on getting um, more of these updates uh, and you can go on to the playlist. There's the A push playlist that's going on. Keep on studying and let's get a five on that exam.